He's loving me too hard. Love is I hard. Have, I might have to kick him out. Yeah, he's love biting like crazy. <laughs> hey, sweet pink. It's time to go. I think you're very cute. And I love you very much. But, but it's stop too it. Much for me. And of course, he like broke my heart because he started down the stairs. But then when he realized I wasn't coming, he like looked behind him like, huh? <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you weathered that attack. Oh, my God. I just it's I wouldn't mind him being in here, except that he can never relax. He can never chill the fuck out. Ugh, anyway, sorry. But anyway, uh, so, yeah, there's also this, the chair that I used to sit on here at my at my desk is actually the, the a chair from like my childhood kitchen table. OK, um, so I got so 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 this all made sense at the time. And it, this is how it currently exists. Um, I don't I don't know. I'm not I'm not a professional mover or anything like that. So I double bagged. <laughs> I double bagged each of the four legs and then like kind of like 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 tape them together to like get the bottom part and then i just like got a big black gallon bag like the big big trash bags and i put it over the top and then like tightened it and taped it so every time i go down there it kind of looks like it, if somebody was like crouching with their back to you oh my god <laughs> why would you do that to yourself I, I couldn't think of any other way to do that because it has sentimental value and I don't have any room in, in here because I also work out in here. So I, it had to go somewhere and it had to, and the basement would be that place. And that's, that was my, that was my best, my best way to, to wrap up the chair. Now it scares the crap out of me in the basement. <laughs> like I go to go to do the litter. I'm like, huh, <laughs> litter, litter. It was already smelly and stressful. Now it's also terrorizing as well. <laughs> Uh, so needless to say, uh, I mean, I didn't enjoy doing the cat litter before, but now it's, but now especially, it's straight up it's traumatizing. Especially menacing. Yeah. <laughs> and it feels, it feels like it, it feels like an attack. Like I attacked myself somehow. I just had a flashback to being like 11 and my stepfather telling me that if my mother changed the cat litter, then I would be personally responsible for having murdered his, uh, child that she was pregnant with. Oh my God, because of taxes, taxoplasmosis? I guess, but like, and that's like sort of legitimate, but to tell a child they're going to be like responsible for murdering another <laughs> unborn child is just like a lot. That's just a lot. So <sighs> here's the deal. Uh, here's the deal. Every week, one of us mm -hmm. tells a story. This week, it's Megan. Finally. <laughs> um, and she's got a doozy this week. And then I'm going to... Um, popcorn in and uh mm -hmm. just flavor it with some rich details absolutely um i don't i don't know the story by the way so yes it'll be well, super helpful of me <laughs> super helpful well i mean we did cheat a little bit you have a genuine genuine awareness but it's because it's a local story and this was a bear to write let me say first off um Oh, it, I felt like I was in college again. It was it was very nostalgic. Should we also just I appreciate this for my podcast. This before you even get started here, this is going to be the first of three parts of this. I was going to get there. Sorry, I just I just I appreciate. There's nothing worse. Let me make like, myself oh, look yay. cool first. Part two. I'm gonna be finished with this story, and then I like get through part two, and they're like, and next time, and I'm like, no. Um, Can you not let me do my own introduction? Yeah, dear, go. <laughs> But yes, as Emily said, uh, it is going to be three parts, um, uh, which is specifically done so. And as we go on, you'll see why, blah, blah, blah. To kind of just kick this off, this is the story of the 1985 um, May 13th move bombing that happened here in Philadelphia. 6 a.m., Monday, May 13th, 1985, approximately 500 Philadelphia police officers descended on 6221 Osage Ave. I'm not, I'm probably not saying they're Osage. I guess it depends on which block you live on. I always thought, yeah, like Osage, Osage but Osage. I, don't, I don't really know, honestly. Yeah. 
<laughs> we're bad Philadelphia. <laughs> we're bad. We're bad at this. Um, <laughs> um, and at the time, it was the home of a naturalist, uh, naturalistic black liberationist group called Move. Upon arriving there, they immediately cut the water and electricity to the house immediately, like right off, right off the bat. Police Commissioner uh, Gregor Sambor and City Council Member Leo Brooks were kind of like at the at the front of the pack, so to speak. Sambor, uh, you know, gets a, a megaphone and is like, attention, move. This is America. Like, literally, that is the, <laughs> this is the quote. And I was like, Andy, can you cue in uh, Childish Campino? Thank you. Yeah, right. That's literally the sentence he said. Uh, the very next sentence happened to be, you have to abide by the laws of the United States and then went into this like whole speech. He like had this whole thing he wanted to say and it was just like really annoying. Popcorn. <laughs> um, well, the the fact of the matter is that the commissioner had wanted to go into comedy when he was younger and he had he had mm. taken improv classes and he just uh. wasn't very good. So he was <laughs> taking the opportunity to improvise a because improv doesn't have to be improv everywhere. It's all the time. Uh, imp- right. Improv's everywhere. <laughs> um, so he was just trying to like, yes, and himself into uh-huh. a bit of a monologue um, because he he knew this would be a big event and it would be covered on news stations around the world. And he thought this would be how he would get discovered. It was a big break. Yeah. yeah I, I, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess you could say he he was so bad at reading the room during improv that he he couldn't read the room through it, the police academy to commissioner to this one spot here. Correct. He improv his whole way. It was all improv then, right? Yeah. Right? I mean, what isn't improv? <laughs> am I right? Like we definitely don't do that ever. You and I, we never do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Popcorn. At the end of his very illustrious um breakout role slash monologue he announced that they had 15 minutes to get out of the house um popcorn which of course they thought he was kidding because they were like (laughs) yo i didn't get that that how that was funny man but like snaps i guess and but, yeah, they, were, they were like cool yeah, they were know. just like okay good one good one man bye yeah. Yeah, like please leave thank you we don't want any bye <laughs> which still is my favorite way to greet people when they come to my house i'll never stop doing that Saying uh, bye. when people come to the house i'll just be like sorry we don't want any and then like close the door and walk oh. away <laughs> i'll never get over that i love it anyway it's a small pleasures right mm-hmm. uh so they're like 15 minutes you know like get out of there a little bit of time pass, and then all of a sudden, a single shot rings out. It is largely believed, you know, that um, the house, the shot came from the move house. But I think it's with the way the reporting had been in, in the past, it's it's hard Kinda to say. But it's guess, yeah. Um, so as soon as soon as that happens, as soon as that one shot rings out gunfire immediately start like just pops off like they're the police are firing tear gas at the house um move is equipped with like semi-automatic and automatic guns they're returning fire it's going back and forth and back and forth like it's just like and like this seems like this no one's really getting the upper hand like nothing's really happening yeah um I mean, for the most part, there was, you know, there was this big fortified bunker, which was kind of like the hot spot and what Sandberg kind of had his eyes on the whole time. So they were kind of had like a bird's eye view and were able to kind of, you know, tactically, tactically kind of have some kind of um, upper hand because they were definitely outmanned and outgunned. So this was it was it was intense. It was really, really intense. The police had fired so many, so much ammunition. They had had to like have the police academy come and drop more off. They're like, um, excuse me, go puff for bullets. Let's go. <laughs> during the during the uh, gunfire, um, SWAT were using um, like different kind of bombs, and by bombs, they actually said entry devices. Huge difference. Really Cute. makes a difference. <laughs> yeah, and they were trying to blast. They were on. They were trying to flank and come in and blast holes into the side of the house via like a next door house. Like they were in somebody's house in the basement, being like, "All right, so we're just like almost like Looney Tunes. They're like, let's draw the circle out so we know what we're aiming for. Like the circles yeah, seriously, over there, seriously, right? Yeah, <laughs> no, but like to no avail. Good old Philadelphia antiquated 
pounds of concrete and brick, I guess, um, because God knows for a very long time, our sewer system was made up of wood. So we've, you know, we have some problems <laughs> with that. <laughs> Overall, the police had pulled up with flak jackets, tear gas. They were in full SWAT gear, 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.6 caliber machine guns, huge bullets, by the those are just huge. An anti-tank machine gun as well, in case they needed armor piercing capabilities. Yeah, right. They did have some, like, the moves did have some steel plates, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it was more like in the initial um, barrier that they had. It wasn't like, they weren't like, tack, like, big sheets of metal over the house or something like that. Okay. Um, and is this just like, this is a row home? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, but it's kind of, it's the West Philly one. So it's a little bit like, there's a little bit of a receding to the house. And it's like, it's like a little bit like, like longer, it's like West. It's it's West Philly, so like it's West Philly style with the. It's not like here in Port Richmond or even on your street where the houses are right up against the uh, sidewalk. So while all this is happening, the bombing in the basement, the gunfire outside, the tear gassing, all of that stuff. Meanwhile, there's there's like just bystanders and journalists like packed up to the barricade. And like, as soon as the shots rang out, of course, people, a lot of people dispersed, but there's just like journalists there with their cameras, like dodging it, you know, different, like dodging bullets and like trying to find the right vantage point and like try to find somewhere to stay where they're not going to get shot, you know? So like, but there was a lot, there is a lot of video footage of all of this though. So journalists were able to get somewhere safe-ish, ish, ish um, to get most of this, uh, which is incredible. Cause that's not always. That's always crazy to me because you think about like now, we capture so much on cell phones, which is easy to do. And then when there's stuff like this or even like like the L.A. riots where there's so much footage of it. And it's like someone had to have like a massive camera on their shoulder this whole time for that to exist. That's just like crazy to me. Oh, yeah. And like Philadelphia journalists were really good at um, being sneaky. <laughs> uh, so they would like they would really put themselves out there on the line and do some stuff to like ensure they got content and they had zero allegiance to the police. They would often, and I'll, I'll point this out several times. Um, they would like be like hiding their video footage just in case the police tried to take it away. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was like, they were very, they knew what was going on and they were, I mean, granted that this was a, this was, um, kind of the last big siege. There's a lot of stuff before that, before this, uh, which I will get into soon. Um, So like I had mentioned earlier, the MOVE members were, there was some like up in this fortified bunker that was kind of like up on top. And then everybody else, including like children and um, anyone who was pregnant at the time, we're all down in the basement and Ramona was there, uh, Ramona Africa, who was kind of like covering everybody with a blanket. She was kind of like the making sure everybody in the basement was OK. Meanwhile, again, police are using even more explosives. Again, excuse me, pardon me, entry devices. <laughs> but again, nothing was really happening. The It was just like it was just chaos and it was just dragging on and on and on. Uh, Mayor Wilson Good um, holds a press conference, you know, being like, yeah, this is happening, like basically formally acknowledging it's happening, the siege that is, I would say a battle, Um, the battle is happening, Um, (laughs) and is like, we're going to get this under control by any means, any means possible, Um, that's a direct quote, he said, by any means possible. So go back to, uh, we're back at, um, was in West Philly at the, at the MOVE headquarters, Commissioner Sambor is, is, is there. And apparently he gets a call from Mayor Good. And then he may, he gives that call to PA state police helicopter that was sitting in a parking lot nearby. PPD Lieutenant Frank Powell dropped two one pound bombs that were basically makeshift. Um, they were filled in with like a, like a, like a dynamite substitute called Tor- Tovex that they got from like the FBI. The FBI was like, Hey, do you want this? <laughs> Um, and they, these weird bombs were dropped on top of this bunker, on top of, of a West Philly row home. The, like from the explosion, the flames were large enough to be seen, but like visibly by planes landing more than six miles away, a cloud of smoke hung in the air. Barbara Johnson, who lived in, um, like, like Pine Street was a little bit further away. 
Um, she was the wife of uh, like a journalist. And so she was kind of a little bit more in the know and was also communicating with her husband while it was going on. Uh, quote, suddenly a naked child dashed from the flaming wreckage near the move headquarters. A team of policemen charged in pursuit. They grabbed him by the shoulders and just carried him off. Oh he kept God. his feet kept paddling like he was walking on air. Um, I'm assuming this is uh, Birdie Africa. It has, it has to be actually technically. Lynn Washington, another journalist uh, who covered it, uh, quote, so the helicopter took off, made a circle and came back. And then the whole neighborhood shook. It sounded like a gas main had exploded, but some of the media members knew it was a bomb and things just went downhill from there. And the fact he, he knew about the, all of this because Lynn was literally stand like where he was standing was near the helicopter and like a bunch of like cops just like rush to the helicopter. They're like, you got to get out of here. And it was like, I mean, like super duper, like unbelievably dramatic. But the problem was not, you know, in, in general, uh, but mostly for the cops, but really for everybody. The bomb didn't destroy the bunker. The bunker was still standing and that was the main, the main target. That's why they dropped it on the, you know what I mean? That was the whole thing. So what actually happens is a fire breaks out and it's, it, it's kind of encompassing like the whole roof. And that's kind of how it starts 45 minutes um, since the bomb went off, setting the fire to the bunker, the whole move house, as well as three other homes are on fire. Um, like the, the straight up the roof um, like buckled and collapsed Another 45 minutes later, the whole block was up in flames. Um, it took it took like just before midnight to contain and put out the fire. The bomb had started a fire that would go on to claim the lives of six adults and five children still in the house and destroyed 61 additional homes in the area. Firefighters had tried to go in as the fire was starting to like rapidly spread, but Sandbor told them to stand down. No, um, this is apparently when he made the let it let it burn comment, which he will testify about later. <laughs> he apparently just told them to stand down. And so that's what happened. Probably salty because his plan didn't work and he had dropped a bomb and no oh shit. <laughs> and nobody gave a fuck about his monologue. <laughs> nobody gave a f- nobody said good job. There is not a single person more dangerous than a bitter failed actor. <laughs> <laughs> Jaded and and just upset all the time. Drinking problem or sweaty or both. Who knows? <laughs> Later, one of the survivors, uh, Ramona Africa, um, who was the only adult to survive, like I said, Birdie, I mentioned Birdie earlier, um, only one child made it out. But she claims th- that um, they had tried to um, like leave the basement at one point, um, but as soon as they popped their head out, immediately, it was immediate gunfire. So, you know, it was basically, and according to Ramona, they were either trying to like push them back, back in the house or, you know, parentheses, kill them. My most vivid memory from May 13, 1985 is the children hollering that they were coming out and being met with gunfire. Today, like, it, you know, even today, like Ramona still has like very significant burns on her body. Like it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, never going to go away really, especially living, especially not for her. According to this uh, an NPR article on, um, that I read about the May 13th anniversary in uh, 2015, for which uh, Ramona was interviewed, um, after the bombing move um, attempted like a gentle rebrand, if you will, <laughs> they tried to like kind of like come come back after these bombings, quote, but I suspected these complicated feelings toward MOVE stemmed from concern by a lot of Black folks in Philadelphia then and now. While MOVE members were crazy troublemakers whom they couldn't, they wouldn't want as neighbors, the danger police presented could be much, much worse and might never be held to account. Um, it was written by the writer uh, Gene Demby. The reason why I included that quote uh, was because this is a big story. It affected the black community tremendously, effect, affected the city tremendously. Um, but the thing that's funny about it is that it's not well known. I kind of like when I came here for college, um, I didn't really know 
much. And then like, I was told about it. And then um, through like becoming a journalist myself, going to like rallies and stuff, we kind of just learned stuff through that. Um, but then when I talk to like friends and people like outside of Philadelphia, they really just don't know. There's a large yeah. demographic of people who have no idea that this happened. They like, it was like, a, it was legit, a, like a legit bombing. It was insane. So I guess the next thing I kind of want to talk about is MOVE. And it, it just before, just to kind of back up before we get into the fact that um, Philly became, quote, the city that bombed itself, which is a term used. Everyone's like brotherly love. And then like in the background, it's like the city that bombed itself. You know, like that's like someone in the back, way in the back. That's honestly like, about right. <laughs> like way in the back's like the city that bombed itself. And then like, <laughs> uh, quote, everything that's alive moves. If it didn't, it would be stagnant, dead. This quote is an embodiment of John Africa's beliefs in creating MOVE as the moniker name for his organization. He is the leader of MOVE. In 1972, though, uh, it was called the Christian Movement for Life. John Africa, um, what he did was he went and met with this like UPenn, ironically, a uh, social worker named Donald glassy and he dictated to glassy what would be called like the gu the guidelines so basically like um, a set of like rules and beliefs and um ways to like he believes that you should lead your life um specifically black people and also it was also the backbone of a communal group like i said mostly black people but uh, there were uh, there was there's like um there's a couple different other races in there too, for sure. But the organization kind of started um, as a group of black people that borrow from like Caribbean Rastafari ideologies and practices, such as like dreadlocks kind of in like the firm belief that natural hairstyle is more in line with life and things that are alive um, and isn't affected by like chemicals or public opinion in general of how their hair should look at all. They also borrow a lot of ideas and principles from like the Black Panther Party and then also um, kind of closely their um, Malcolm X. They kind of believed in radical green politics. They wanted to return to like, like nature, um, hunter gatherer uh, kind of society and rejected um, most of, if not all of um, like modern science, medicine and technology. They, in the sense that they kind of wanted to create an oasis for themselves, um, that was the, the idea. Um, all living beings, they felt, should be treated equal and justly, um, and therefore all living things um, should be treated equally and justly too. That means like literally, literally everything. Basically like some, this can't be right if not all of, if, if this isn't included. All of the members changed their last name to Africa in reference to John Africa, who defined the last name Africa as paying respect to the continent, as well as their, as their understanding of God or, quote, mom nature or Muma. Quote, the MOVE organization is a family of strong, serious, deeply committed revolutionaries founded by a wise, perceptive, strategically minded black man named John Africa. I got that from onthemove.com. So are they still mm -hmm. active? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the website, you know, kind of goes into even, even more. And I would suggest just go, you know, go there and, and read it yourself, you know, read the information, take what you want. Also, you know, I'll say quickly that like modern day, it's, it's more, um, it's more like take it or leave it kind of stuff. It's not quite got quite it kind of kind I wouldn't of say like mellowed no out attempt. it just kind of became less literal over time I guess yeah. it's like the uh, some of some of it there so the categories that they break into and there's a lot uh rigid that uh religion dash life uh natural law self-defense right and wrong the system moves work being a revolutionary persecution leaders living as a revolutionary family our children appearance raw food distortion caring for life and lastly the name Move. <laughs> move again, just to, I kind of said this indirectly before, but move is not an acronym. It's just the word move. That's so funny because I definitely thought that it was. Ever, I mean, which is fair because, yeah. because so nine times out of 10, everything, like no one uses periods anymore. <laughs> no one uses periods in between no. letters anymore. It's chaos. 
It's chaos these days. It's graphic design, <laughs> Megan. <laughs> you're right. You're right. I just don't appreciate it's graphic design. This is choice. my fault. <laughs> it's my fault. I just, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> um, so again, I mean, just to kind of summarize some of these, they believe in life and the, the preservation of life and life is everything. Um, belief in natural law. Um, they will defend themselves if instigated kind of thing. Like, you know, I think at one point Delbert Africa was just like, you know, if you bring clubs, we bring clubs. If you bring guns, we're probably going to bring guns. Like, which is very, very much a, um, a, a, a Malcolm X kind of, thing, of ideal. Um, they also, they, they also were very, it means legal doesn't mean right. That's the right and wrong section. Legal doesn't mean right. So just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. Um, that's the truth, right? That's <laughs> Which is it. completely true <laughs> that their revolution overall is to stop and reject the system overall. They do say that John Africa is not like a leader, He's more just like a guide for all of them or like a resource kind of thing. More like a, like, so to speak, like a well, like that they pull out of, I guess it's, it, I don't really know how to explain it um, any better than that, but uh, so, they didn't, they wouldn't, they didn't go to him, like consult him all the time about everything. This is a hot take because even if the answer to this question ends up being yes, I don't think obviously that what we already know what happened in 1985 was justified. This does sort of sound like a cult. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think in, you can really make cults tend to be hard to define. And I think there is a wide scale of, of things that it should contribute to it. But I also agree. It has a lot of like very strong cult vibes. There's a lot of now, cult to vibes. be fair, I'm also very much of the mindset that like any organized religion seems like a cult and we only call the new ones cults. So it's like. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, yeah. It, you know, Catholicism is a cult. Sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. hundred percent. E eating <laughs> the, the body and blood of of your alleged savior oh, is that's right. fucking culty. But shit. like but like it's not actually LOL, you know, Um. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, they, um, very, yeah, very like they're, they're, and I'll get into even some more things that you're like, yeah, you're going to kind of be like ticking off the, like the cult checklist okay. a little bit. Um, but in no way, shape or form is this and even remotely a doomsday cult or any kind of like evangelical, like money laundering thing or, uh, sex trafficking or, you know, like, it's like, it's not, it's just, it's very much like. So there's not any known like abuses occurring within the organization. Correct. Yeah. Not, yes. Be how we would characterize it as a cult a yep. lot of the time. Okay. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Like I just figured I'd, because I imagined that there were pe probably people listening who would be like, that's a red flag. Yeah. That is also a red flag. Exactly. hundred yeah, percent. And that's where my head went, head went to absolutely hundred percent. Yes. Yeah, uh, they and even the bombing it feels reminiscent of like Waco a little bit. But the right. thing with with Waco is, well, not I don't think the government. I mean, we could talk about that's a whole nother. That's thing. a whole. That's a whole pivot with its yeah. own nuances. But <laughs> no matter which way you slice it, what's his face was like molesting the kids in the church. So Ew. it's like that's that's Ew. when it's like on a scale of like culty organizations that's going to be on my no-no side that's the no-no side yeah yeah that's a no-no so side. okay yeah. so as, <laughs> as long as we know i'd say it, generally there's a lot of there's a okay. lot of cult like um features and okay. aspects but there's um, not any like abuse or manipulation happening there's they're not, not like, gross about it and enormous yeah. <laughs> like power imbalance they're not or, like pieces of shit about it yeah cool. <laughs> yes okay. exactly very yeah, chill yeah. okay um so some of those beliefs that, that got um pretty uh sp specific um they don't recognize the institution of marriage however they are monogamous all children were born at home all of them so then therefore no birth certificates just, just so everyone knows, just so everyone knows. But yes, all home births, it, 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 yes. It, they claim no drugs, cigs, or alcohol, um, an emphasis on healthy um, and like strong, like put in labor, like do hard work kind of thing. To go back to uh, raw food distortion, they did eat a lot of raw food, like raw food. No, yeah. thanks. Yeah. 
<laughs> it was a big thing, like babies and stuff like that. I mean, I heard like if you get used to it, you get used to it. Now, just just to clarify, you're not talking about eating raw babies. No. <laughs> No. You're talking about feeding raw food to babies. Yes. Okay. <laughs> what did I say? Clear. Did I, did I yada, yada, yada it. over that? Sorry, my bad. No, no baby like, eating. Raw Sorry. food, like babies and everything. And I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> no, no. Bad phrasing. Bad phrasing. Thank no, you. I, like, <laughs> you're like, I'm just I appreciate out. that you said something and didn't just be like, sit there, be girl, like, confused. <laughs> <I'd> be, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Really? 10 out of 10. Cause swooping in there, appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously I mean, because like, again, I, you know, I'm I'm seeing the couple of red flags. If they were eating babies, that would be a big. No, one. That would be another one, yeah, for sure. And that yeah. would maybe push them over more to the bread the no no side, side yeah, of the no no side the chart. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of some of the things. There's a lot of other, uh, you know, they go into further explanation again on the website. But overall, like at first, they just kind of functioned like an animals rights advocacy group. They would, you know, they would go and protest at zoos. They spoke about animals a lot. They were just taking in animals all the time. Like they were just, they were like, they were just like really into animals, which is cool. totally normal and not weird. Um, <laughs> they also, but like no one could really pin them down either because they were kind of very public. Um, they didn't really, you know, they're, they were just doing like exercises and like living communally very, like very publicly, like, you know what I mean? Like they were kind of just this group that, you know, no one could really like pin down what they were all about. Move, not only was move aware that their public image was a little confusing, but <laughs> But they were like, good, fantastic. We don't want them to really understand at all what we're doing. So perfect. We've done it, guys. High five. <laughs> um, and lastly, something that was like, it was was pretty, I, I, I see it as pretty cool or positive affirmation um, to each other. They would say on the move to each other as kind of like a, um, an affirmation of their shared experience and interests and belief and um you know, membership to this organization. Also kind of like, you know, like on the move, like keep working, nature is alive, we are alive kind of thing. It is, but again, catchphrase is a little tick there. Uh, I thought you were going to say it was like their aloha, like they say it for like hello and goodbye. <laughs> no, just kind of like a, yeah, just kind of like, a, I don't know, like a, I don't want to say catchphrase because that's not what I mean, but like kind of like a way of, a formal way of kind of like checking in. Chicken in. Yeah, that's like what I'm saying. It's like okay. a catchphrase. <laughs> Branding. Anyway. Popcorn. Um. <laughs> uh, the thing is, though, they actually did have an, an an official catchphrase that was not just on the move. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, that was short for the catchphrase, which was <laughs> oh. on the move, getting in the groove, keep it smooth. <laughs> oh, so it was more of like a lyric. Apparently, it wasn't more of like a lyric. No. <laughs> it was a it was a vibe, an extended was, vibe. <laughs> what? Yeah, a vibe that went on. An extended vibe. Cause that was their whole thing. TM. Was just... <laughs> extended vibe TM. Yeah. Trademarking that right here, right now. Anywho. Popcorn. Um Ramona very clearly uh state stated would you know but consistently that they were not a black nationalist group they had several different races in there um you know it wasn't just a black interest it was a back to nature very spiritual organization that so it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that there you know that there's other races there it was kind of like what she kept on like trying to like explain and when Um, was this like cropping up um, so this is, we're, we're in the early seventies right now. Okay. That tracks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so um, really super duper quick um, because this is in very, very important um, in relations to this group, as well as, I mean, we, we even see it today with the black lives matter movement um, and even anti fuck because a lot of people thought anti fuck was a group of people. Again, forget about that. <laughs> so I really wanted to explain really quick. Black nationalism is the belief mentality idea that the black race should be celebrated and fiercely preserved and defended. So a great sense of pride in that they should, it's something that has value and should be protected. And then the Black Panthers was kind of an extension by that, by kind of being like, we, we're we never, the rest of society, mainly white people in the system, are going to try and 
um, destroy that because they want to control us. So therefore, if they come at us, we're going to we're going to we'll be ready. Um, Yo, speaking of <laughs> stuff that I was told as a young child that I didn't question because I was a young child. My father straight up told me like I I think I read it in a book somewhere and I was like, who's Malcolm X? And he was like, he was a terrorist and the Black Panthers were terrorists. And that's, oh, yeah, like, that was totally the vibe. Said. That was totally the vibe. And I was just and, like, that's that's unfortunate. Why did wh-? I would always be like, but why? Yeah, I mean, I for some reason, but no I one would obviously I did, but just nothing ever went with that. I think it was like maybe his tone that made me like not want to ask right. more questions. Yeah. So I just was like, yeah. well, it's my dad. Why would he lie to me? But mm-hmm. yep. he also had me write a book report in third grade about how Ronald Reagan was my hero. So, yeah, all you parents <laughs> out there, be careful about what you say to your children. <laughs> <laughs> or just like give them facts and not your exactly opinion. yeah be careful about it yeah <laughs> like that like also reverse psychology is real so like yeah be like this like, is this is weird the yeah, more all this, all like trash talking is weird. you try to like make them into your image the more they're gonna fight you so like just skip that whole skip bitter step and skip like it. just give them facts and let them make up their own minds about stuff yeah mm-hmm I agree with that. <laughs> and or like empower them to like find facts themselves. Yep. Um, but important to note, I do, I'm not trying to say that um, the Black Panther in any way, the Black Panthers in any way are a monolith of Black nationalism. They yeah. are just a ready, uh, readily available example. Again, there's different scales of Black nationalism. Sure. Technically, everybody should be a Black nationalist. Like everyone should see value in them and protect sure. them. I mean, in there, just to address any, like, you know, whatever, I, yeah. there there are, like, very extreme branches of Black nationalism where yes. it's, it is, like, Black supremacy. And, like, that can be intimidating. I don't on- honestly hold that against anybody because, like, when you're beaten be down for that I'd long. I'd be so mad all like, the time. But there, so like, for instance, there's like a um, black supremacist group that gathers on like a corner that I drive by sometimes and they will like be yelling in the street about how like our women should be like in the house and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, the nation of Islam, not that chill for me. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm about to mention them actually. Oh, sick. (laughs) Sorry. I just, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, yes, you're you're, you're correct. Yep. Exactly mm-hmm. like you're saying, like they're, you know, it, it the Black Panthers are just the most popular example of a black nationalist group who, yes. uh, you know. But I would say they're also like, they're like, again, closer to liberationists, I think is a better term, but I'll get there. They might like squarely be like, it, if there was a scale, like not that I'm an expert, they might like even squarely be in the middle because they were like, yeah. had like some militant elements, but like yes. weren't, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And even then like, it kind of felt like more of a commentary about the American system and the military complex overall though. Sure. Um, so um, yeah, that's kind of, um, and to echo what you were saying, Emily, there's there's different scales of this. There's no one size fits all for any of these. Um, separatists, black separatists are people who believe that um, there should be two separate nations. There should be the black nation and then there should be every, everybody else. They would be where I would, I would say an extreme version is the Nation of Islam, um, which is a group here and throughout the United States of a very conservative version of Islam, but it is primarily black. They here in Philadelphia do demonstrate a lot. They're they're a very prevalent presence here in Philadelphia. I would say um, I used when I used to work in like Center City by Chinatown, and I would go to like do the bank deposits or whatever. Um, they would be right there outside of a outside of the PNC where I was going, like demonstrating. Yeah, and they'll um, be out like with a bullhorn, like. And they're and they're very they're you know they're very passionate they're you know and all this stuff like they're, um you know very much like talking about how white people are evil and all that stuff you know like I mean, fair that part's not wrong. Fair. I mean, I, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I I really don't have any problem with them uh, at home. Like I'm just kind of like you know. Yeah, that uh, whatever they're allowed to, um, you know, believe whatever they want and sure and demonstrate and yeah. like do 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 what they got to do. Um, so they would be an example of separatists. Um, they will just believe that they just want to come. They like don't even they don't even want to try to deal with it. They like, which is also fair. Um, they just want to have their own like separate nation and just kind of be left alone. And they think they're owed that based on the slavery. Yeah, <laughs> slavery which is and fair. Then, 
I, which is completely fair because of, I, like I said, I, I got, prefaced yeah. the whole thing with like, I, you know, yep. I am not a black person. That is clearly not an experience that I've had. So you, I guess, got to do whatever you got to do. Yeah. Cause if, they've just, yeah, it's just, you know, they kind of recognized that it was, or they felt that they recognized that like there was a, they were, they were given a severe handicap from the, from the jump. And like that, the only way to fix that would be, would be completely, you know, very, yeah. very real, very They're specific. responding to a fucked up system. They're exactly. not like coming up with that out of the blue. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that is uh, the kind of the, the different difference between nationalism and separatism. Both are kind of used interchangeably, but they are different. So I did want to kind of just mention that um, yeah. up the top because it is important. I would say liberationist is, is, is the word that I would associate Janine Africa, quote, we demonstrated against puppy mills, zoos, circuses, any form of enslavement of animals. We demonstrated against Three Mile Island and industrial pollution. We demonstrated against br police brutality, and we did so uncompromisingly. Slavery never ended. It was just disguised. So Glassy, if you remember Glassy, he was a social worker who helped with the uh, guidelines. He owned, um, he owned a house. It was kind 